What a time to be alive, the age of information. So many people questioning creation. Come, take a seat or step outside to have a conversation. Let's listen, observe, and respond with compassion and truth. Welcome back to another episode of the Fearless Shepherds podcast. My name is Kyle Cassidy, and I am joined by a very special guest, a Los Angelino, Mr. Evan Cudworth. Evan, how you doing, brother? Hi, Kyle. So glad to have you. be here. I'm stoked you're here. Yeah. I'm stoked I found you on Instagram, too. Instagram is such a such a cool thing, and, and in moderation can be used as such a tool to bring people together. We're in very similar walks, and you actually were an inspiration for me. You're on a... Uh, little bit of a sober journey right now, and we'll dive into that a little more. I just think it's so cool to be alive in this time of information and of collaboration now that we're coming out of two years of lockdown. We're entering into a summertime of, I think, abundance and of community and this desire for people to come together, share ideas, share passions. If you want to talk a little bit about your ideas, your passions, and what it is that makes Evan, Evan. Well, thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here. What makes me me? The story that's actually coming to mind right now, and maybe we're jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, what I saw that you had invited me on this path and looking into your journey and sort of faith and where you are, I wound up in Los Angeles after I grew up in Chicago, partied my way to New York, Shanghai, Cleveland, all over the place. And when things were not working in my life, I ended up as far west as I could go, uh, ended up here in Venice. And... When I was finally able to get a little bit of time of sobriety, I was starting to get bored. And I was like, okay, I want to feel some more energy around me. I remember my friend at the gym, uh, wellness was starting to become more part of my life. He invited me to come and do this breathwork class. And I'd never done breathwork before. And coming from the Midwest, where like crystals and mood and breathwork and everything LA was such a turnoff to me. I was like, I don't want to go breathe in a church, okay? Like this is the last thing I want to do. I want to go do acid in the desert, right? Like that's what I wanted to do. But I remember I, my mind was opening up and I remember I, I trusted this guy. He was really, he was just fit and smart and like he, he wasn't drinking. And I was like, okay, I just trust this guy. He seems like he has his stuff together. And when I got into that church and I started breathing and they tell you that your fingers are going to get, um, you're going to turn to like pterodactyl fingers. And if anyone has never done breath work before, it could be a pretty scary experience the first time you do it. But what I realized, I, my ego dropped down and I went to this place where for the first time in a long time, I heard my subconscious and the part of me that I had done so much numbing to get away from was just at one with who I was in my body. And I, of course, I pulled back immediately. I was like, I don't yeah, want to go there anymore, right? Fast forward a few months later, and I, I'm out sitting on the beach. I'm actually doing beach breath work with somebody else. And the sun is setting, and I'm out here in Los Angeles. And as a guy from the prairies of Illinois who never cared about this stuff, who our biggest dreams were like, can you make it 14 hours of drinking on St. Patrick's Day? Like, that was my God. favorite thing to do. <laughs> um, I'm out here, like, breathing at sunset. I had finished doing my CrossFit and I felt in the sand beneath me as I was doing this breath work, I was like reaching down and I felt sort of at one, not only with like all these grains of sand around me, but I had had this fear of like what came after, what was going to happen next to me in my life. And I got to this place just through breathing where this little voice in my head just came and said, yo, Evan, it's going to be all right. And out of that moment, I was able to go to Burning Man completely sober and have the best week of my life and feel absolutely connected with people that I, in the past, would have been like needed three drinks just to talk to this person or uh, would constantly be like hiding behind the porta potty to do whatever I needed to do, right? Uh, but I could just fully be there and present and be myself. And so, who is Evan now? I am somebody who has felt like I've had to work really hard to find peace and to be there. And I'm not there all days. I'm there some days and I'm not there others. But I want to be like that guy at that gym who like took me to go breathe into church and it, it altered and changed the course of my life. So what I do is, is I 
try to be a light and show all these amazing things that you think are not possible for yourself. If you think you can't walk into a party and feel yourself without a drink, or if you feel like you can't start your wellness journey. When I got here, I was a little coked out twink from New York. Who yep. Like but that was who I was. And now I'm not perfect, but I, but you're shining. Brother. I'm shining. And I feel that. Yes. And, uh, that's, you don't have to be alone in whatever path that you're going on because I felt alone when I wanted to change or I wanted to move. I felt judged by my friends or I felt, and they, I want to be clear. Like they were not bad friends. I was They're one, not clear on what I wanted. <laughs> and, and we were, we had very different goals at that time. And as my goal shifted, I just wanted new people to uh, usher me along on that goal. I feel like so many of us are being called by God or by source, whatever you want to call it, to step into areas of quote unquote darkness and shine. And so it's such a unique time of, there's a lot of darkness in our world, and we are kind of images of the opposite. And it's not that we don't have darkness within us and that we don't struggle, because that is, that's a part of it. But I think stepping into more of a spiritual path and understanding that your breath and your connection to your personal practices that you start to develop on a daily basis, for me, bring me closer to God. I feel God speak to me in ways that I never have before. And to touch a little bit more on the, the sober aspect of clearing the mind of distraction, clearing the mind of the fog. I've spoken on a couple of podcasts. I've been sober for about three months. It's helped me to develop patience with the process. And never too high, never too low. You're actually going caffeine-free. This is day five. Indeed. What what was the biggest inspiration behind you going going cold turkey on these substances? And what what do you think is something that keeps you going on the days that are difficult? Awesome. Well, first of all, congratulations on three months and whatever it is. And we talked a little bit about before uh, before this too. I do not identify as fully sober. I don't have a date of when I start and stop things. But the way I like to think about it is I talk about intuitive or short-term sobriety. And what keeps me going is I talk often about my biggest fear has always been untapped potential, right? Where, where am I not showing up for the world? I want to experience the most that this world has to offer. And one of the reasons why I love drugs and booze is because it opened up things that like at the time in my life, I didn't have the confidence or didn't have the ability to go and say what I wanted in those spaces or to get those things. And, and psychedelics and drugs and booze allowed me to experience all of those things. And I'm really grateful that I was able to do those. Right. On the other side of it, when, when I noticed that I was not able to experience many things because either my hangovers were getting worse or I couldn't be in a space because I felt like I needed to have something in my body to be in that space, what had become freedom, I realized had become the opposite of that. Wow. And I, that's okay, right? Right? Like, but now what keeps me going is that desire to continue to experience the most that I can in the world and know, and I've seen death, and I've held death in my hands and I've seen what it looks like. And it's, we, time moves faster and slower for every different types of person. But I do feel pretty good in that I live a life where like if I run out and get hit by a bus tomorrow, that I'm pretty proud of the day that I've lived the day before. And what I noticed is when I do bring drinking back in my life, and I still do once in a while, if I'm spending that full Sunday hungover because I've had that time and the bus comes on Monday, like, hey, is that last two days worth it? Yeah, maybe. But like, how do I just at the margins? decrease the number of regrets that I'm going to have and maximize the joy that I'm going to experience in this life. I love the untapped potential conversation because that creates anxiety. And I think a lot of us use substance to escape anxiety. And so developing healthy habits to deal with anxiety because we're not alone in that. And actually, I think it's more so prevalent in today's world of comparison, social media, and even living in LA, just the kind of the comparison that we we go into as coaches and as teachers and as guides 
It's so cool to be, in my opinion, stepping into a collaborative community, let's all eat type of mentality coming out of COVID and, and really people just yearning for connection. And so being in LA, you've been here five years. I've been here four. It's amazing to see the energy right now that's, that's cultivating. And I feel so stoked that we have collaborated. This podcast is starting. There's so much good that's happening. And I am an optimist. I like, I like to focus on what, what is good and what can I control. So in regards to being able to connect, create community, event coordinate, what is it that you're most looking forward to this summer and beyond? And uh, go a little bit more in depth on like, first of all, how can people find you on the Insta? Follow your story because I found you on Instagram and your stuff is super inspiring. You have a gift in regards to lifting people up, putting positive content out there. And I think that is so important nowadays for coaches, influencers, people of any walk, especially that of like spiritual, um, to give people something to look forward to and to be a part of. Awesome. Well, for, I want to come back a little bit too of sort of your decision around the around the sobriety, sort of what was that untapped potential and where did that come from? But in terms of what I'm excited about this summer, maybe we can unpack a little bit from this. Something that I've been working on for the past you know, year and a half, essentially, is I've done a lot of coaching and one-on-one -on -one coaching, which I really love to do. And through that, I find that gap in where people's potential are and say, okay, how can we show up in the morning? So they'll call me for 10 minutes every morning. We start with gratitude, we'll ground, and then we'll essentially think of different words. So I'm working with a client today and she wants to feel more. Uh, we chose words like recovery, stimulation, and creation. Right. So how are we developing activities that will show up for her in the day so that she feels those things as she steps into the day? So this is doing a photo shoot with herself. This is instead of burning herself and editing for four hours, it's doing two hours, taking a break, going and doing yoga and building that recovery and it's setting boundaries around. So these are habits and activities that we, no matter how many books we read or, or podcasts we listen to, are sort of hard to develop on our own. It's really helpful to have a coach on the outside to help you develop those. And so what I've been working on is that takes a lot of time and my energy is how to scale that. So I've been building an app that I call Vibe Curator. And it's an app and community about sh creative short-term wellness challenges, right? So this was born out of this like seven-week program that I ran where people come and decide on their version of sobriety, whatever that is. Maybe for you, it's giving up booze. Maybe it's giving up another substance. For me, for right now, it's caffeine. Um, but how, like, what is that? And then what are you creating in that space? And all the, all the knowledge that we know exists out there is like, oh, start with your gratitude practice, do your affirmation. Are you, um, proactively like planning your weekends, right? All those things we know we're supposed to do this step-by-step -step tells you exactly how to do it. And it gives you a community where we come together on zooms twice a week and say, yo, I didn't show up for this this week, or I did or didn't do this, but it's a non-judgmental space to do that. So in terms of community, what I'm really building on this summer is I'm I want to find other communities and areas where we can come in and find whatever their mission is and like sort of overlap this coaching structure on top of it. So one thing that I'm working on right now is um, leading up to the 4th of July, a like declare your independence challenge, right? So think about it. It's like up to the 4th of July, starting June 1st. If you, for me, I'm starting this caffeine thing early, but I was saying, listen, I've drank caffeine every day for 15 years. Am I an addict? Yeah, probably. <laughs> but like, I would have never admitted that, right? But it's, this is me declaring my independence. I'll, maybe I'll go back to caffeine afterwards, but this is just an opportunity for me to do that. To, to survive in that, I need a structure of people around me. I need a gratitude practice every morning. So we have a discord where people come together and, and we, we list those things. So I'm really excited to scale what I do one-on-one -on -one and build a community out into that and find other communities that are hungry for this kind of a thing. And the app's really cool because you can do little check-ins every day. It will send you little notifications. Um, but uh, there's little, there's a lot of, you know, I, I ask very deep questions, you know, these really big questions, you know, like where is, I've been asking these questions, like where has caffeine been like your friend? Where has it been my enemy? Where has it been a ritual that is not only in my ADHD, but are there places where it shows up sexually? Are there places, like all of those things. And these are uncomfortable, weird questions to ask. But you're willing to go there. This vibe curator is a safe place for you to do that. And I guarantee you will step out the other side with 
not the kind of self-awareness where you feel guilty about it, but the awareness where you're like, oh, dang, I'm just glad I finally figured that out. For sure. It puts a mirror up and you're able to see yourself from your highest potential and say, okay, this is the path that will get you here. And that's the yoga practice for me is such a good way to tap in with God and to, to look at yourself from a higher perspective of God kind of pulling your, pulling your heartstrings in a way that is like divinely guided. And when you talk about like big existential questions, that's the biggest. And I think for me with this podcast and with, I created something called the spirit movement. So everything that I'm doing is spiritually fueled, whether that's physical fitness, mental toughness, or even something as simple as the food you eat. Like, is it spiritually fueled? In the yoga practice, ahimsa of non-harming, it's very, we just live in this consumeristic society of overindulgence of right now, you know, and, and in regards to the escapism of our society as well, the, the problem that I think is presented to people is deal with your problems later. They'll always be there, you know, and then as you keep putting it on the side, it gets more and more, the volcano starts to get a little more uh, active. And it's going to burst at some point. So I think what you and I are trying to cultivate and are cultivating is an opportunity for people to be vulnerable without the existential crisis of judgment and fear. And I think a lot of my early days of Christianity, I felt a lot of judgment and a lot of fear surrounding my belief, which I've talked about on other podcasts as well. I started to drift from my faith and I started to think, well, they're making me feel bad, so I'm just going to feel good. And what made me feel good was substances, women, and friends that were telling me what I wanted to hear, not the friends that were sharpening my steel, telling me I shouldn't be doing these things, saying, hey, let's go do this, this, and this that are positive, and people who wanted to go to church or wanted to break open the Bible or talk about spirituality. And so for me, it's been since COVID hit, I really felt the Holy Spirit talking to me in ways that I hadn't in a long time of just like, I have plans for you that are bigger than this. I want you to step into a space of shining my light without calling people out on things that it's not your job to be God. And I think so many people are turned off by faith because they step into a church and they're told all the things that they're doing wrong, or they try to open up the Bible. They don't even know where to begin. So kind of tie into these big conversations and big topics. You shared with me a little bit about your your faith journey and we share a very similar journey. Would you say that there is a pull in everyone's heart space right now towards more answers and more um uh, of a spirit movement that's happening and in your own life where where do you feel that coming forward? Oh, great question. I I don't know if I want to speak I got obviously I can't speak to everyone's heart and what they're pulled to. Two things. One, I I do believe that there is a shift obviously happening coming out of COVID, right? As people come back out and they're like, okay, the way that we were connecting before, something wasn't right about that. However, I feel like I'm not a big duality guy, but I do feel like there is a lot of an equal, if not heavier, shut off of 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 being so suspicious and believing that like do my own research on everything and taking not like nothing is is real and we're breaking out of the matrix and I see just a lot of well I'm gonna figure it all out myself because all the institutions have failed us and that's that's it could be a liberating place but I think there's really scary stuff there too and I'd say again I'm not in either one of those camps fully I'm so and this is the perfect maybe transition to that. I've always been one. So my first fear, scare of unwa- uh, fear of wasted potential. The second fear is being labeled with without my consent, right? Or being being locked into you are this one thing. And I think where that first started to show up for me inside the church is, you know, I loved the church. I loved my community. Um, I played cello in the praise band and was an active musician and, and I had really great parents. I never felt oppressed in that way. But when I started asking questions around, you know, why are we endorsing certain political ideas? Isn't that ex- exactly what, you know, Jesus tipped over these cha- these tables about? And, and so as I started questioning, like both new to Old Testament, a lot of things, but then 
you know, where it really started to become very personal for me is around like freshman, sophomore year of high school. Um, the, my feelings for men started becoming much more apparent, right? And I was like, okay, this is going to be a problem, <laughs> right? I have to figure this out. And I remember we uh, we were at a, like a New Year's Eve, like, you know, most Christian retreat, like up in Wisconsin, and everyone like raising their hand and us singing. And they brought in a speaker to talk about this guy who, um, who's about his brother who had come out to him as gay and how he, the choice that he made was to cut this person out of their family because wow. Jesus was more important than that. And this was supposed to be like what, what we were supposed to learn out of that it was like, you choose Jesus over these sorts of things. And I remember sitting there and being like, oh, crap. Um, but I, you know, I, the courage I had at this, this age, I remember going and talking to my youth leader who was a ex-military, huge six foot four, just giant guy and being like, hey, you know, like I think this is me. Like, I think I'm having these feelings. And he was like, okay, like, don't worry about it. Like, we'll figure this out. He never spoke about it again, but slowly all of my leadership positions were stripped away. I was slowly taken, sort of moved away from everything. And very soon I started to hear even rumors about myself. And pretty soon, like, it was just like, I was not even welcome at all in that church. Wow. And I, you know, I, I find a lot of, I don't have too much resentment about it because I know what it's like to have an ethos and have things that are important that you're told that like, this is what's going to hold us together. And this is why these things are important. And to know that if you don't have standards and you don't have things like that, like it can be really difficult to, to hold these things in your mind. But for me, being able to hold two ideas that are diametrically opposed together in one mind feel like that's always been a strength of mine. <laughs> and yeah. I wanted those both. And I believe the God that I connect with, that is what God is. For sure. Is, is the ability to, like, to be present to sin and to be sitting across from it and to, without judgment, like, bring your heart to it and say, hey, I... There's something that's probably not right for you right now, but I'm here on the other side of this for you. Like, we'll get through this together, yeah. right? It's yeah. like Jonah and the fish. Yes. So that to me was, I've, I've, I've read the Bible and I was like, I felt like we were reading two completely separate books because everyone around me was, was doing the exact opposite of what I, what I understood this to be. And could have hoped to have felt yes. by just being your true self. Yes. Yeah. Um, so naturally, you know, like I became, I went hyper intellectual. I figured this is where I can prove myself. Study, you know, president of everything, top of my class. I was like, I want to go to the hardest school I can possibly go to. Got into University of Chicago, nerdiest school you could possibly go to. Literally, our, the motto at the time was where fun goes to die. You know, <laughs> I, was, I was going there because I thought, I was like, this is a place I can go be a monk. I won't have to worry about my... I didn't come out of the closet, right? I, I, that was the only person I told, right? Um, and yeah, I was, I was fooling around with like guys on the soccer team, but it was like, it, it was this separate thing, right? right. Um, of course, I get to school and... Well, do I ever want to tell this part of the story? I, I think it's important it's open to book, even brother. say. It's yeah. an open book. I've told this on another podcast, but I think it's important to connecting all of these ideas. Yeah. Um, I remember I did not really drink. I didn't, I was very, I did not want to drink. I wasn't partying at all through high school. I was cared about school. I cared about acting, cello. But I remember like in that summer in between, I remember like our show choir was, was partying a little bit. I remember like probably the second time I got drunk, but it might've been the first like that coconut rum in the backyard. I remember like holding onto the grass because the earth was spinning around me. You know, that first drug feeling. And then this boy that I had liked, that whatever, like we rolled over and like, I we like kissed in the grass, yeah. right? And in that moment, it was like, oh, booze lets me do this thing that like I've been too afraid to do in any other way, right? So it was this like weird unlock. And then I was so scared after that, but you know. But- get to college and this intellectual guy, but very quickly, you know, it's, it's the most rational school ever, right? There's just no real room for that. And went fully into this. I joined a fraternity. I became the party guy, but I became this both and right. I was both like the masculine fratty party dude 
who's also the gay guy who could bring all the girls to party, who also like still had this like Christian past and like, have all of those things in together. But I go back and look at my journals from that time and I describe having this anvil on my chest, right? Of just feeling so, I was going through so much. I was playing Romeo in Romeo and Juliet at the time. <laughs> and I actually came out to my Juliet like two nights before <laughs> the, the, on the stage? play. Like right before we went on stage. It almost ruined the production. Because yeah. it was like, everyone was like whispering about it. And it was yeah. like, what is going on here? But that was the dramatic theater kid I was at the time. Uh, but to tie all of these pieces together, like my faith fell apart because the community and the, and the way that I understood what faith was, the people around me were not practicing that and told me that I was not invited inside of that. And I found love and acceptance inside of a fraternity and inside this like intellectual space that loved me for all of those things. And I learned a lot. And I got a lot of good things. And my best friends are still from that time. But it took me 10 years and finally a lot of depression, my mother's death and um, holding her hand like through the end and, and really feeling that, that put me on sort of a depression spiral. But till I finally came out and decided like I'd reached the end of everything and getting sober, finding men in recovery programs that taught me how to reconnect with a higher power, that was in many ways is, is still Christian for me. I would not go so far to call myself a Christian, but uh, that I can pray every morning, and I still do, that that is part of my ritual and routine. It's amazing. No matter how, I, this last three, four months of my life have been really tough. And if I did not have these rituals and routines, I did not have whatever I have with this purpose and faith, I know I would be back out there um, trying to self-medicate in other ways. The aspect of creating these, these rituals for yourself it's it's something that you can fall back on and prayer is such a beautiful feeling of like a divine hug of that two-way conversation you can have with God and i find it so awesome that you're able to step into this like this podcast is called fearless shepherds we're going to have a lot of men's circles where i look forward to having you there to be able to share your story and help people to realize like you can have a sexual preference that's, that's different than mine but that doesn't mean that you're any different than I and and I've been talking a lot about divine masculine and how people who are gay can still step into that without us in Christian faith or any faith for that matter casting this box as to what you have to fit into and when I think of Jesus Christ I think of him truly putting a hand on your shoulder and telling you that you're loved I have a sister who's gay has a wife has a child with her it's like and my family has cast a lot of judgment and I have cast a lot of judgment coming from religion and in the times that we're in with a lot of movement and a lot of like warping of masculinity. I think it there's this internal dialogue of trying to find an answer to what is true north and what isn't and it's not my job. And so compassion, love, understanding, and conversation allows us to realize there's not a whole lot different from you and I. And so it's really cool to be able to have conversations with people who are in the same walk in regards to profession, in, in the same walk in regards to cultivating in the same city, and realizing that there's so much to be had from listening because it helps us to realize there's not a whole lot different from us. And when I look at society today and I look at the polarization of left and right, and I look at all the stuff happening in the world, it's so much about division and about this person's doing this, this, and this, they are cast out. And then when I look at religion of like, you're going to burn in hell forever, like it's so hard for me to wrap my head around that. So it's just cool to be able to hold space as a Christian to widening my perspective. And then when I got into teaching of yoga, of realizing there's more to life than just Christianity. And there's a lot more religions. So talking to people from different faiths and understanding that it's okay to not know. And it's okay to hold space for people that think differently than you and meet at a middle ground and say, I respect you because I know that your path is not hurting mine. 
And as long as that's that's the understanding, like God is going to do what God is going to do. It's not our job to try and be God. So, dude, epic, epic testimony. And that's what we can relate on is testimony because I think we relate more on each other's struggles, hardships, fears, almost even more so than our triumphs. And it's very good to share triumphs and have friends that build you up and hype you up. But like, I think this divine masculine and what we're creating is a place where you can be vulnerable and be safe and find strength in vulnerability because you don't have to dwell in that vulnerability by yourself. You're able to see other men and women be vulnerable, cry, do whatever they need to do because that release, that natural chemical release that our body is trying to do, but we've been told for so long as men to suppress, it's freeing. And you're able to wear your heart on your sleeve like we were talking about earlier. We, we're told so much as men to not do that because it shows that you're yay or it shows that you're this or that. And it's like really defining who you are through what comes naturally to you. And then through prayer, through, through Bible studies, through even yoga classes, all these different environments where you can show up and be genuine to who you really are and talk to people from different walks and, uh, and just understand a deeper, I think just a deeper look at what God's love really is. Because when you see someone wholeheartedly being themselves without having to put a mask on or please someone outside of themselves, it's so cool. And I think it really shows the potentiality of what we're stepping into in, in regards to uh, peace and in regards to Revelation, which is truly a lifting of the veil. I don't see this as anything more than peace and love coming to the forefront of what God wants us to be, which is is peaceful and loving. Jesus' biggest two practices were loving God and loving the neighbor like you wish to be loved. Yeah. Where do you find that most challenging on your day-to-day now? You know, staying faithful and optimistic in the darkness. And like we were talking about earlier, walking into a dark room lit up and consistently lighting my fire to be a beacon of light. Because a lot of people depend on me for that and it can be burdensome. It can be a lot. And so I have to continuously find ways to motivate myself as an entrepreneur, as my, as my own boss. There's benefits to it. And then there's also burden to it. And I think for me, the hardest part is remaining steadfast in my daily practices of faith, knowing that it's not my job to save the world. It's not my job even to save my clients or the people that I work with when my ego tells me that that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And then I'll beat myself up if I'm not doing what I expect myself to be doing. And so it's taking a step back from being the savior complex into being just steadfast in my practices, knowing that I'm wholeheartedly living the way that I'm supposed to be living. And so in this city, there's a lot of, there's a lot of polarity between abundance and scarcity. And so for me, I've been stepping into this abundance of knowing my worth, knowing what I'm capable of being and providing, but then also holding space for like listening more. I'm such an energetic (laughs) vibe curator that everywhere I go, I'm the center of attention, even if I don't really want to be. And so learning how to take a step back, learning how to observe just as much as I kind of make my presence felt. And I truly think that through prayer, my prayer practice has become not just in the morning and at night, but I'm praying often when I'm confused, when I'm overly energized, when I'm under energized, like prayer has become like this discussion with God. Journaling has become a discussion with God. And then bringing people around me, like through sobriety, and I'm not saying you have to surround yourself with only sober people, but the more I've stepped into that, the less I'm in areas of uh, disassociation. And I'm just surrounding myself with more people who want to have conversations like this, who want to dive deep into the vulnerabilities, the confusion. Why is the world doing what it's doing? How can we be the light? And so my faith practice since COVID began, I was alone and I'm a people person. So that was difficult. And then to see the riots, to see the race wars, to see the agenda that I felt was being pushed to continue to separate us rather than bring us together. Um, it was, it was a dark time for me. I was like depressed. 
I was very sad. I was very alone. And I felt the Holy Spirit come in and give me that divine hug and just be like, this is all happening for the world. We're bringing a lot to light. And you're going to have an opportunity to step into faith and be a beacon of light like you've never been before. But these are the these are the practices that I need you to start developing now in this time that you have of solitude so that when the doors open, the floodgates are going to open. You're going to be able to step into a kind of a role of vibe curator in a way that you never have before. So it's been cool to cultivate personal practices that then now my circle of influences is asking me towards how can I be more steadfast in my practices? And I can come from a place of genuinity saying, this is what I'm doing. And what you're doing is going to be different, but these are things that have worked for me. And the more that I'm stepping into that, the more that God is opening doors and opening my understanding of consistency being the key. And like you were saying, there is so much more struggle that presents itself when you step into abundance and when you step into understanding your true purpose here on earth, because the devil or whoever you want to call it loves misery and misery loving company, wanting you to pull back from stepping into that is a huge hurdle when you step into your faith, when you step into these daily practices, you're going to be presented with so much resistance. And that's where you have to lean in even further, knowing that you are divinely guided and that God's true desire for us as children of him is to be in alignment with our purpose, our path, our gifts. And those three things, when you really sit down and meditate and pray on like, who am I beyond what I do professionally, beyond who my family sees me as, like, why am I here? I was able to really dive headfirst into those practices during COVID. And I was told who I was by God, not by who the world told me I was. And throughout the practice, the world is going to try and tell you who you are. So it's consistently finding the, the power of prayer for me of, God, is this true? Like, is this who you say I am? Or can you realign me with who you say I am? And that's pretty quickly when I'll be the heartstring will pull me back towards the path less traveled and the path that I know I'm supposed to be on. And then holding space for people that aren't there without judgment. Because again, it's not my job to save people. It's just my job to shine God's light through me so that they can maybe see it. Do you believe, do you have a more static view of yourself? Like, do you believe that this is the way that you have been and are and will continue to be? Or do you believe that that we iterate and change and that it's important to like move and change based on how the world is? That is such a great question. In my past, I've seen myself move and change more. I'm finding myself becoming more static. And the reason being is because if I don't stand for something, I fall for anything. So if I don't stand on foundational principles and then still be able to meet people where they're at and hold conversation and understand where they're coming from, but still be able to like bring myself to my understanding, that has helped me tremendously to stay consistent with my practices. Whereas when I'm more free-flowing, in regards to sobriety, I have fallen off. And I don't think my way is the right way or the wrong way. It's what's worked for me. So in the last, I'd say, six months, my practice in regards to Christianity has become very consistent, which in turn led me to be like, maybe you should take a break from the mind-altering substances. And I think it's directly correlated so that's, to that. This is going to be my next question was, yeah, like what is what did the three months before you made this decision look like? Were you constantly negotiating with yourself? Totally. How, yeah. How, what did that, yeah. How did that decision it was a lot of ultimatums of like, <laughs> yeah. okay, yeah. I'm never smoking yeah. again. <laughs> yeah. And then my buddy would hand me a doobie and I'd smoke. And then I'd beat myself up for three weeks smoking every day like, you're a fucking failure. And that, that's exhausting. And we live in a society where what we're doing is not normal, right? Everywhere we go, there are people who, it's not even that they're trying to escape. They just like, Ricky Bobby, I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> and it's 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 kind of sad because at every street corner 
You have liquor stores at every in LA. There's Bud stores everywhere. Like it's just normal to get high. And so as I got deeper into my faith, I was just praying like, God, why do I feel this desire to distance myself from substance? And I kept hearing that if you feel the way you do, and you've been doing this for 10 plus years, what's the issue with taking a month? I I kept getting the month. Take a month to completely, because they say 21 days to build a habit. So give yourself that extra extra week to really solidify it. What harm is that going to do? If you've tried this over and over and you've given yourself these ultimatums and you've broken them and then you feel like a worthless whatever, give yourself a month to learn how to say no, first and foremost, which as a yes man is very difficult. And I want to people please. I want everyone to like me. So saying no to my best friends and them being able to ridicule me without me like standing firm it was like this moment of, of freedom knowing that I was capable of saying no, that I was capable of taking back my, just my sobriety. I hadn't felt it for a decade plus. Yeah. So the first week was very difficult. And I had to get rid of all my bongs, pipes, weed, alcohol. I had to get it out of my house, which was it was freeing at first. And then the next day I'd be like, damn it, where's my bomb? <laughs> and then second week, I just was like, okay, I can't focus on these things. I need to create new habits. So I was more consistent with working out. I was more consistent with yoga. I was more consistent with my Bible. I was more consistent with the relationship that I'm cultivating with my girlfriend. I was more consistent calling my parents and family and like all these subtle shifts second week, then transition to third week. And by third week, I wasn't having those urges. And when I'd see other people and they'd offer it to me, it was very easy to not say no. It was just, I'm not doing that right now. And and people would see that I wasn't coming at it from like this really harsh place. So they'd be like, all right, cool. And I'm also still life, like very lively in parties sober. And I started to see that. Whoa, I can have fun without this like, what do I do with my hands feeling? This anxiety is no longer there. By week four, it it wasn't even a thought. Like that was now who I was. And now I'm three months in with literally no desire without the judgment towards people that they're wrong or sinners for doing what they're doing. But I've I've planted seeds in a lot of people's lives to where they're dibble dabbling. And I'm not saying that that's a good thing or a bad thing. I just think that it can cultivate clearness towards your purpose, your path, and why you're here. And that's what it's done for me. And now I'm wholeheartedly believing in my profession, what I'm able, able to cultivate and how I'm able to show up and serve. It's, it's cultivated deeper relationships with my clients, deeper relationships with the people I care about most. And there's still struggles, you know, like it's not all rainbows and butterflies. Now I have to really deal with my emotions. I have to really look myself in the mirror every morning and say, okay, if this hasn't gotten done. There's no one to blame but you. So it, there's there's positives and benefits, but the positives for me far outweigh the negatives. And I'm not saying I'm never going to drink or smoke again, but for the chapter I'm in, doesn't serve me. Yeah, and that's and I love that. First of all, oh, I just whenever I hear these stories from people, it just makes me so excited because, as I said, like I'm not here on a moral crusade. I'm here, like I still think there's space and and everything for that but i am on a possibility crusade like Mm -hmm. if you don't think this is possible for you why do you think that's not possible like what what's limiting you from from being able to like still be your best self and step into a party um or or be with your friends or feel those emotions in that way sober and then to go back and do it another way the other side but if you're why i instill these this program around the short term sobriety is it does it takes it takes a couple months right to get to your to get to that clearness to get the reps in same way as when you're joining the gym you know if you go in and you try to squat 400 pounds it's not you're not going to hit it you know so you've got to go and and you got to put on the little fivers and you got to do your stuff and like you're going to be sore yeah you got to be sore yeah and you've got to and have a coach there can be really supportive and i think a reason why a lot of people never 
change or get help is because there's so much shame around this. And the current system, the way that it works, is you either go to AA or you go to rehab or nothing. Like there's a there's nothing. All and right? there's so much shame that yeah. comes with AA or rehab yes. or anything like yes. that. Which which there shouldn't be. Right. Those are incredible places right. and, and you'll get a lot there. But I don't think they're a fit for, in my opinion, probably 50% of people that, that make their way there. And there's there's a lot of risk in doing what I'm doing. And I'd say the biggest fear that I still have and what I've trolls on TikTok, not trolls, people who have genuine concerns <laughs> on TikTok come to me and they're like, do you realize what you're doing? You're like enabling, you know, like if you say that this is possibility for people and they relapse and your blood, their blood's on your hands, right? Like Gosh. that is a terrifying thing to have, right? And of course, that's that's not what I want to do, right? And, but I think of all of the people and myself included that like, I walked into my first AA meeting when I was like 26 in New York and being like, this is not for me, right? Like this is, this is just not it. And it was another like five or six years before I was able to like take any change because there was, there was nobody coaching me that, that I could live a happy, healthy life by changing my attitude into why I needed these certain things. And actually what I found out is like my undiagnosed ADHD of my chasing dopamine was counting for like a huge portion of why I was like self-medicating with cocaine. I was the person who I do coke and I feel calm and normal. And everyone is like, I see everyone else can rob me crazy. And it's like, it made me feel just normal. And I'm not somebody who's ever been in trouble. I've never been to the hospital. Like none of those things have happened, but I was self-medicating in ways because I just, there was no, the structures, the way they were before told me that it wasn't possible. I had to give up everything forever or live in this, these two extremes. Correct. Which is the same thing with the polarities of, of Democrat, Republican, and how it's bleeding into literally every facet of our lives. And it's so difficult for us who are in a middle ground that want to have conversations of, hey, I see where you're coming from. Listen to where I'm coming from. How can we how can we meet in a middle? It's like that is not allowed. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a movement happening of people who want to meet at a middle ground and are sick and tired of the the harsh judgment. It's not a bad thing to judge and to stand on something and to want to know deeper as to why. But if it's not affecting your life, liberty, and pursuit. Why do you have to get so bent out of shape over it? Yeah, I completely agree. And I'm somebody who's, I've mostly been progressive, um, but I was a log cabin Republican for a while. And like, I've, I've, I've been on both sides. I've always like, I've always been that person who's had probably as, tried to have as many like, Republican friends as, as Democrat and really do. I Since I moved to LA, I've had like more, I had like more friends that had voted for Trump that didn't. And like, everyone was like, are you crazy? And how are you able to hold these two things in your head? Like, don't you like, hate these people? And I was like, the way that they, these are the people that show up for me at my gym when I ask them to. These are the people that show up for meditation for me. These are the people that are, listen deeply to conversations and are curious. I'd say for me, the law, where I draw my line is where curiosity ends. So I will say, in my opinion, I find the right is a lot less curious than the left. And I find that really frustrating because there's, it comes from like wanting dogma and they find, and we, they find community and that's good. And they're able to find, and, and, you know, there's all, a lot of studies out there that show that, um, you know, this goes back to, you know, every great dictator, but having a common enemy is a lot more bonding than having a commonality. Right. So when you can find that common enemy and, and, and position yourself around that, it doesn't mean that you have to have anything in common next to you. All you have to do is hate this thing over there. And, you know, I was very frustrated through the Trump years um, of like my groups of friends that were just constantly like regurgitating these tweets and sort of all of these things. And whenever I spoke out against what I saw was happening, I never used his name. I never use anything. I talk directly. I always talk about policy and who it affects. I never talk about those those sorts of scapegoat. And you know, I found, and that's you know, a lot of that started to happen on on the left, right? Of of just of this kind of thing. 
granted, I think there's a lot of really crap. Like, there's a lot of genuine things for that. But where I've seen my friends go down into far right and QAnon and things like that here is that's, well, you know, that's a weird type of curiosity, right? But that's a curiosity of fe- like feeling helpless and wanting to believe that like there's some giant organization that is plotting against you at all times. Yep. Like that's a really comforting place to be. And chances are there's just like a lot of really un- incompetent people out there. And sure. it's more comforting to think that people are in control than are not in control. And you sort of give up curiosity because you just believe that, that that is there. So, you know, I live in that both end and I really like to br- be in the both. Um, but um, I do feel that this shift, <laughs> one of my first ideas, like when I was um, coming out of school, is like I had this idea of wanting to like one day like throw dance parties. Like we'd like take, you know, urban like urban rural together and just get people together and throw dance parties and like we just need people to like dance with each other because i truly believe like these healing rituals will heal the world right i'm working on a book right now called detoxifying positivity how better parties will heal the world and it sort of is taking i'm very early in the research phase this is going to be a three or four year project right there's so much Work and ritual, but you know, every great society has had some sort of a ritual, and a lot of them use substances and use these things to get us in a state where you can connect deeper, right? And you can get to these places. Yeah. So very clearly, like morally, these things are not, you know, are are not walled off from that. And I don't think they should be because some of my biggest breakthroughs have been on psilocybin. Yes. But then once those connections happen with your neurons it's like they stay with you in your sober realm yeah. some of the creativity that i've gotten from marijuana stayed with me in my sober realm so it's like you can utilize those things as tools i think god put them here for a reason but if you're dependent on them for that connection i think that's where the mm-hmm. balance can come in yes so where are i know you're working through a lot of dependencies but looking forward into your life where do you feel like you still are dependent or looking for or, or want to reevaluate your, your relationship to things? Wow. That is deep. We spoke on it a little bit earlier of like being a coach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that dependency on coaching. Yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and even in this podcast, not stepping into a place where I know it all. Mm -hmm. Because I'm still a student, Mm -hmm. just as much as I am a teacher. So really, really, as a 29-year-old, I want to step into life coaching, mentorship, inspirational speaking, all these different things, but allowing the process to unfold organically and spending just as much, if not more time, in studentry than I do in coaching. Mm -hmm. Which is, I like, I want to talk a little bit about yoga. I don't know how much more time we have too, but for me stepping into yoga teaching in the last year, I'm so grateful to end, you know, every the teacher and student in me loves and respects, you know, the teacher and student, all of you. And I, the ability to go and teach, it, it allows me to focus my energy onto things, but to feel more like a student when I'm teaching a class that a teacher oh, is the coolest thing in the world. Yes. And I've learned so much every time. And I'm having these big blocks right now in my teaching where I've become, I get a lot of amazing, really great feedback of your energy. And I take, and like I move through it and, and I create these playlists and the experience is really great. But I, I put myself on stage and I feel, I go back to that person in high school who is like ready for the applause and ready for that. And I have not been able to break out of that. I still, I want that validation. I want that applause. And I know that's part of what we do. But to, to, pull, to move out of that and to make contact and to give, to give adjustments and to do that work, I was trained during COVID. And so we, we, did, we weren't even allowed to do adjustments. So there's still, lear- I need to go back and get more training in teaching. But that is where I'm, I'm noticing myself is I'm still dependent. My ego, I lo- I. Gold stickers don't do anything. Money doesn't do anything for me. All right? I thrive on validation. And where, wherever I can get that, I will suck it up. <laughs> and so yoga could be a place for that. But I know there's, there's a reason why there's all these stereotypes of life coaches and 
yoga teachers who are these like weird egomaniac back and forth people. And I see myself falling into that sometimes, right? Um, and but always coming back to I'm still learning. I'm still like that this part of this process is gonna be that I still get to learn how to unlearn that part of of me that wants that validation. Uh, because I've had so many great teachers and mentors and people who were those things too, right? I've learned some great things from some great egotists. Some of the greatest yeah, teachers. Yeah, yeah. And what's funny for me is like, when I get too wrapped up in that, I, I lose track of the why. And the why for me is that same feeling I had when I took my first class where I could tell the teacher was there to be of service. Teacher wasn't there to do cool poses and show off. Teacher wasn't there to make money. All of that stuff comes organically when every single person that walks in the room, you look them in the eyes, you ask them what brought them there, get a kind of an understanding of what they need. And like you said, of being a student and a teacher, I've really started to understand like the divinity of teaching yoga. You are showing up first and foremost, which is the hardest part of any yoga practice. And not only are you showing up to do the practice, but you're showing up to be a vessel, a conduit of what they need to hear. So when you just realize that you teach the way that only Evan Cudworth can teach, and people show up for that, and if you don't get the standing ovation, you've still planted the seed that needed to be planted when you let go of the egoic, I need to get this out. Like I've just really learned how to transition in, and it comes and goes like everything, but the best classes I've ever taught are when I had zero expectation of applause, had every expectation of literally being a conduit of what whoever was there needed, whether it's one person or 60 people. And I think consistency is such a huge part of it too, of showing up like in the world that we're in, of creating content, of teaching classes, of working one-on-one. It's just about showing up and not putting unrealistic expectations or not putting this comparison on who someone else is. It's like, why do you show up? And why do you feel compelled to show up? Which is where for me, faith comes in. God is pulling us in ways that we can't see, but I think the world needs more coaches, needs more spiritual guides, needs more physical instructors, needs more nutritionists. We live in a world of of like health and not health. And there are a lot of people who need just a gentle nudge. And then realizing that if it doesn't work out, that you don't have to dwell in that space, you weren't the teacher they needed. So you're the teacher that a lot of people need, but you're not the teacher that everybody needs. So I can relate to you big time on the wanting the approval of every single student. And if I don't get that five-star review, I'm like, I'm a failure. I'm not good enough. And that that is truly, I think, the devil. I truly believe that like the devil was the, the most beautiful angel in heaven, but he wanted more. We are so gifted and we have so much abundance, but we want more. And so checking in with the why and being grateful that we live in beautiful places. We have clothes on our back. We have our health. We're able to lead and guide and people feel compelled to show up because they enjoy the way that we make them feel. And then in regards to the spiritual practice that I'm developing and stepping into more of like a spiritual coach, it's like, I can point you in all the right directions, but at the end of the day, it's, it's your practice with God, not me facilitating your practice with God. So for me, it's stepping off the gas pedal of trying to be this savior and trying to be this coach. And just like, like you were saying, showing up as a student before you show up as a coach and then the coach kind of just comes organically. Would you say that you've developed a little bit of like in your spiritual practice, starting to kind of talk to people about that? Or do you let that happen organically in people's lives? Like, have you started talking about your journey spiritually or your practices, your prayers, different things like that with your clients? I do. Uh, I can give you an example. Like yesterday, taught a, a yoga class yesterday and the song that I was ending with was this one called Soft Landing, which was produced by somebody who I met at Burning Man. Uh, I'd like known through other things and 
I talked about like the soft landing of sobriety of like well, after you like get all this place and like this chaos happens and when you feel that soft landing happening and like I don't know if that's where the that came from, from that title of that track or whatever but I shared a little bit of it so I was like hey you know like I used to feel like s- the substances were what got me in the present and now I realize that I can achieve a soft landing through this type of practice and I could feel in the room, like two or three people being like, Ugh. and then the rest of people being like, oh crap, oh crap, like we're in this right now. Like this just shifted from being like, let's come here and like look good and it's mirrors on all sides to like, oh, like this is actually connecting to how I felt Saturday night when I was alone in the bathroom by myself. And like, it's so cool to have that. And you, you, and you learn, you know, you've got to be intentional about that. You got to be careful. Oh, act. I don't know if you have to be, you have to be intuitive about it. <laughs> um, if it's too intentional or too practiced, it, it doesn't fit right. But I just felt, I don't know, it just came to me in that moment that somebody in that room needed to hear that to, yep. that day. And isn't it funny too, that the two or three people that reacted to it in a certain way, you don't have to then react to their yes. reaction. Yeah. You can be steadfast knowing that that even if one person, you have shifted their awareness of what self-love is and of being able to show up for the sticky stuff. and. Um, I think that's a huge part of faith is realizing that through the simple interactions that we go through on a daily basis, we can save someone's life. And I think there's a lot of people behind closed doors that are suffering, including you and I. Like we're not alone in this human suffering. So the more that we show up for each other, hold space, not create this this judgment and this hatred towards what's different, but finding the commonality, not the common enemy, bro. That is powerful. And I just, I applaud you for what you're doing. I don't know you. We've literally, <laughs> this is the first time we've met yeah. face to face, but really I cool. felt compelled to come and talk to you because of the way that you shine through social media. And we're on the app Locals together. I don't know if you're an ambassador, yeah. but yeah. big shout out Locals. Yes. yes, Locals. Well, speaking of which in the community, let's, yeah. I think there's a such cool opportunity to, you yeah, have to push those limits and start to build that kind of a thing this summer. I do notice, I think, you know, we're in a saturated market here on the West Side. And again, we're so lucky to be here. But at the same time, there's so much competition and everyone's running a conscious event and there's this thing here. And like, it's, it's dope. But with that competition, I've noticed one of the reasons why I do what I do with this Moon Crew that I host, which is a non-toxically positive place where you can come as you are and people come in their sweatpants and they come and they share about stuff like that is because I feel like I've been at at these events lately and it's like it's a competition of who's the most conscious and it's and it's who's (laughs) and it's who's the coolest coach who like and it's all about social whatever and how many followers do you have exactly and listen I and I get it and I'm motivated by those things as well but I guess a frustrating thing that I've gone through over the the past year of this coach thing is I've had really great, I've hired great mentors and coaches and gotten some good advice. And I think even advice that works for a lot of other people, but it is, uh, you know, in the realm of, you know, you need to get like social, um, what's the word called? blanking on it now but basically like i've had to like revamp like what's your transformational statement what are you promising what is this exact thing that you're giving to people and who's your ideal client exactly and and there's and there is that i think it's important to get and i've honed that in a lot of different ways but i've spent hundreds of hours in the past year like honing that and changing it why i asked that question of do you feel like you're static or you iterate I think this, like, we're coming out of, like, Silicon Valley, like, iterate, A, B, test everything, and, like, find the problem and then go fix it. And I think there's a lot of value in that. But I'm noticing myself stalling out a little bit because I'm in this constant iteration mode. And, uh, like, oh, this next little iteration is going to be there. But it's hard to be consistent when I'm showing up and I'm getting three views on a story that I think is, like, truly myself. But maybe that's the one that you came to, right? Um, so I don't know. I do not have that figured out. Uh, I just, I just, I keep, I'm not consistent, but I am persistent. <laughs> you know, I can, I, I, I've always, I will sh- keep showing up. 
um, as myself, as maybe a little different version of myself because the seasons of my life change. Uh, but I just talked with a client a couple weeks ago who we knew each other in college and she had been like wanting to change her relationship to alcohol for a long time, but like had done the same thing, ultimatums or like constantly coming back to it. And I made this big, bold declaration of like, I'm going to do this thing for a year. You know what? I actually, I've drank a couple times this year, right? I, I pulled back from that. But guess how many people have like, there's like seven or eight people that are on this path because I was able to show up and do that type and create those things. And I'm back on it. And I have this, my intention for the rest of the year is, is to not drink again. But, you know, there was, there was intuitively in the moment, I don't regret any of it. I did it for, for my specific reason. Um, but she is now has not drank at all. And she's talking about like the ways that she's showing up for her family and, she, she get you talk about getting rid of her bongs. She took her mat that says, like, hey, thanks for bringing wine, you know, or whatever, and threw that out. Later. And she's like, I don't need these things anymore. Yeah. Like, I can, I can step into a new potential and maximize the new potential that I have for my life. So, anyone who's made it this far in the podcast and is listening to this, and if you feel in your gut like that piece of potential that is, that you know it's there, but you feel like you can't get it on your own, know that it's possible for you and you don't have to get there alone. Like there are a bunch of codependent coaches out here that are ready to help you. Uh, but but you've got to believe in yourself. You've got to make an investment. You've got to take it seriously. You know, the the most dangerous client is the one who's expects an instant transformation for zero dollars. And like, if you're coming with that attitude, you're, it's never going to happen, right? As we've as we've proven, you've got to go through the boring consistency, and that's probably my third fear is boring consistency. But when I spend my life in it, and when the better I get at it, the more um, love and joy and faith show up for me. In the world. Never too high, never too low, because consistency can be boring, and it's really about perspective of like. 1% better each day. And I love stoicism and I love just being able to like look at progress, even if it's very minuscule in your egoic mind and tying back into events and like, you know, say five people come, say one person comes, say 30 people. Your ego will tell you that that matters. But like, I think in the Bible, it's saying when two or more people gather, God is present. It's like, you never know what a simple thing in your mind means to someone else. And social media can be such a tool. Face-to-face -face interaction for me is more of an importance. And I think that's why Locals is so cool. This summer, there is going to be, like you were just saying, for people still listening, so many opportunities for you to step outside your comfort zone, do something that you haven't done in a very long time, and find people that are very similar to you, that are that are wanting more, that are looking for more in regards to deeper relationships, more fulfilling outings. You know, for me, it was starting to be too on the beginning of the journey of just going out and seeing so much like loneliness in the together. that I was like, something's got to change. And it starts with you. So I'm really excited to cultivate some collaborations with you, bridge the, uh, the networks and the communities and just continue to support each other, show up for each other because it's, this health and wellness movement, this spirituality movement, it's not a fad. This is like people realizing that life is short and these vessels that we were given are more perfect than we're told. And the more that we start to attune the frequency that we possess of, of faith in our practices, faith in our spirituality, faith in knowing that it's okay to not know, like you're able to slip up, fall short, and get back onto the horse rather than slip up, isolate, run away, move to a new city. Like, no, there's so much support around us. Um, I'm just excited for the summer ahead. Yeah, I agree. And to, yeah, close, like, uh, just on that not a fad thing, I think it started with, I mean, obviously COVID kicked things loose, but like we're seeing it reverberate over everything, right? People, like my friends at Goldman Sachs are saying, no, I'm not coming back to the office and you can fire me if, if not, right? Like it's, it's all levels of people and it starts with people saying no, right? And to, to maybe fault of their own, but like 
boomers who lived in this like this nine to five and then you numb on the weekends, this boomer technology way of doing things, like it's really, it's dying, right? And and it's taken a lot of courage and a lot of people saying no to things. And it's been really this last year and a half of like not jumping at like job offers that are going to pay me my salary and get me my stuff. And like having to hustle every few days for clients and new things is like not how I'd prefer to spend my life. But I'm making this choice. And even if I grind myself into the ground and fail at it, I will have, I'm more proud of how I spent my last year than I would have been to to go to something that was safe and never have tried this as a possibility. Create sparks too, because yeah. I truly believe that when you start to open yourself up to divine guidance, it's not going to be easy and there's going to be a lot of challenges, but I think there is such potential for breakthrough in regards to helping others step into abundance through what they love doing. And I think that's the age, like you said, the, the boomer era is dying. The nine to five, pay your mortgage, get married, have a family. It's, there's a shift. People want more. People are asking existential questions. People are calling out for faith or they're doing things that fill their cup more. And so I just, for you and for everyone who is stepping into that, brick by brick, build the temple one brick at a time and realizing that there's going to be days where you're out of mortar and you're not going to build bricks and that's okay. You know, and just like knowing when to, to, to reach out to different people and, and Hey man, I see the, community you're, you're growing like i'd love to be of service in whatever way that you can be and like i think what we have to realize is humans want to help each other more than we're giving ourselves credit for and humans want to collaborate more and like covid was such a it was the opposite of human nature isolate cover your face be in fear like for two years two plus and for some people they will live like that forever so it's just allowing empathy and compassion for people that think differently, live differently, but still, like we were talking about static or, or sturdy, like it's so um, difficult in the biggest trials to stay steadfast because I think that's right before the biggest breakthroughs. So just knowing that like you're on the right path, you're doing things that are changing people's perspectives on what's possible and what's not. We're living in a time that I think we're going to look back at and be so proud and so excited that we were able to step into what we felt divinely called to. And uh, like in regards to festivals, there is more artistry now than I've seen in my life. And there's more opportunity for a cultivation of a health conscious. I have a lot of friends who are going to lightning in a bottle. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'd be. Ugh, I should be there, but you know what? I, I yeah, same. Yeah, and, same. And I did it for a lot of reasons. Yeah. That could be a whole other yes. podcast. Yeah. yeah, same. <laughs> but I think it's it's knowing that there is opportunity around every corner. God wants us to be abundant, not scarce. The devil wants scarcity, dependency. So really allowing ourselves to know that we're capable, we're worthy, we're teachers and students, and just allowing life to be this dance like you were talking about earlier rather than this cubicle feeling um because when you're free and when you do step into like uncertainty i think it the pressure creates diamonds it allows you to really see why you're doing what you're doing and really leap and then the net appear so like let's make this summer a summer that is one will look back at and say that's when true breakthrough happen let's do it best summer ever let's go yeah well dude thank you so much for your time just just a quick motion of what you got going on this summer what it is that you're uh going to be cultivating and how people can find you so you can find my instagram evan under slash cudworth uh same with tiktok on there uh i title has been shifting i was calling myself a party coach for a little while um, but basically, I'm a vibe curator, right? That's what I do is where vibe means in harmony and purity means to take care. So what I do is I run pro, so like creative wellness challenges for you to come take care of yourself and be in harmony. Whatever season of your life you're in, let's happen. So one of the things I'm running, I'm working on it right now, I'm calling it best summer ever, where if you want to declare your independence from a substance, 
leading up to the 4th of July, during the month of June, we'll come together and there's a full support system for you week by week, day by day. You'll have a support system that says, this is how I want to show up for the world. We'll teach you how to do a gratitude practice, how to step, how to talk to your friends, how to step in social situations. Um, so we'll be running that mostly online, but, uh, Community events, so much cool stuff I'm working on this summer. Um, I'm working on a surf and skydive event where we're going to surf in the morning and skydive in the evenings. But basically all these ways we can get adrenaline, get dopamine, all these kinds of things are so possible um, in that space. Um, you can catch me teaching yoga if you're in LA every Tuesday, Friday, 8 a.m. at Dominate uh, on the beach. And there's a dope social community there. Uh, but most of all, I would just love to see you on a dance floor. I have not stopped dancing. I'm still out. I'm still out doing festivals and dancing uh, wherever I can and would love for you, no matter where you're on this journey, let's go. Um, I'll put you up on my shoulders, no matter who you are, and we'll dance <laughs> to the front. All right? Dancing is going to save this world. It will. And I look forward to, you know, Austin, a friend of ours, mutually. We've been talking about a Christian music festival and really just like a music festival where you can come and not try to escape, but try to try to find yourself, try to find purpose, try to find your creator and like-minded individuals who want more to life than, than I think what the world is offering. So God bless you, brother. God bless. See you and talk to you soon. It's another episode of the Fearless Shepherds podcast signing out. We will talk to you and hear from you soon. It's amazing how quickly conversation goes when you're speaking about life and God a lot of these questions that can spark fear, spark judgment. That's what this podcast is all about. And really, that's what life is all about, is to, to step into faith with a yearning for knowledge. So if you want to learn more, if you want to donate to the cause, my name is Kyle Cassidy. I am the founder of The Fearless Shepherds, and I cannot do this alone. So I would love to hear from you.